And now we wait to find out if we're live. How can we ever know? There's an audience out there. I guess. I guess so. I guess they would tell us. They would let us know if we were if we were alive, if we existed, if we've collapsed the wave function. The the existential crisis that is astronomy cast. Do we exist? Are we real? <laughs> is this a simulation? Yeah. Yeah. These are the questions that haunt. Um, <laughs> So you remember when we used to watch the COVID tracker? I don't know if you still go watch the COVID tracker and just watch the horrifying number of cases that are going on and growing and growing and growing. Yes. I found the opposite. I found the, the, the healing to that, which is the vaccine trackers. That's amazing. Yeah. So people are like, in Canada, it's tracking what percentage of the population has received their first vaccination, how many shipments, how many vaccination shipments have been sent, which provinces are getting it, um, et cetera, That's et cetera, et cetera. Awesome. Yeah. And there's going to be, there's, there should be those for like every, every country and stuff. So, so although it is awful, it, you can now watch the hopeful version as well. Because I do, like every day I look at the world that the that the lists and just go like oh you know however many so, people so have died but where i live the vaccine tracker is still not happy i according to a story on national public radio earlier this week st louis has received less than 1000 vaccinations which isn't even enough to vaccinate everyone who works at our teaching hospital yeah, to vaccinate the vaccinators yeah, yeah, and they're not expected to get any more shipments until February. Hmm. Wow. So we're looking at the earliest they will be done with uh, first responders and people with comorbidities over the age of 65 Yeah, is like April. Yeah, Alan Boyle already got his vaccine. Saw that. He's over 65, I think. Oh, okay. I guess that's how it works. So we're at 1.1 million doses have been delivered to Canadians and we have 30 million people. You're rocking it. And oh, it's it's not a lot. It's like 2% or something. 1.8, yeah, 2% of Canadians have been vaccinated with their first dose. It's still awesome. What what gets me is Israel has already done 25% of their population. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. And so hopefully, I mean, just like this is this is everyone's light at the end of the tunnel is is switch. Find a vaccine tracking website that you like and and just follow. So I'm using one called COVID-19 tracker.ca and it tells us what's happening here in Canada. But but find but find that and just and, ignore all the news about mutations. The vaccines are still good for the mutations. So, so less good. They're going to drop the total efficiency a few percent, which increases the amount of people mm, that need vaccinated, need vaccinated to get herd immunity. Yeah. From what I heard is it's just, you're a lot more likely to just get it. That, that the precautions that used to work now, it's something like a 50% increase in, in, um, transmissibility. And so it's just, it's just the, so so that's the the B117 variant the concern is with the South African and the Brazilian variants um that oh, uh, the Brazilian one doesn't respond to um the 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 infusions they do of of blood cells immuno things i just lost yeah. a word um, from people who've previously had it. So they've, they've lost one of the major treatments and it's causing significant mm. reinfections. It looks like there's a 10% um, decrease in how susceptible it is to antibodies. That's the word I lost. Right, right, right. Um, hey, Andrew and Planet got it. Congratulations, Andrew. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so there, there's two variants that, that uh, actually... It, increase your your susceptibility um of getting it a second time and of the vaccine not working okay and i've been brought a tennis ball that now needs banished yeah throw it what can no, happen i'm hiding it behind the chair yeah, know, so that she can stop bringing yeah. it because if you throw it then she'll just bring it back yeah 
All right. Uh, if you're wondering what it is that you are have stumbled into, of course, we're going to be recording a live episode of Astronomy Cast. This week we're going to be talking about gamma ray bursts. But since we've already done this before, uh, this is the reburstening. Did you look up when we last did this? Early. Yeah. 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 Like seven episode seventeen or something. And so it's so I put this on the list. Because I went through this exact thought process, which was that there was a bunch of really interesting research about gamma yeah. ray bursts, about the sources like, that we now know what's causing them. Everything's changed just in the past three years. Right, exactly. And so then I was like, have we covered the changes? And then I thought, I don't think so. Let me check. And so I checked the archive. And yeah, it was like 500 episodes ago. I'm like, okay. Then we we'll might as well just do this one from scratch it'll feel that way yeah yeah, yeah. totally because there was like a new one i don't know if you saw the one about a magnetar causing a gamma yes. burst yeah okay good so we've got colliding drone stars we got we've got magnetars and we've got, we've got um just monster supernovae so um and possibly other things as well so it's interesting how what was thought to be a thing is now a zillion things yeah each of which is super fascinating so okay cool so we <coughs> will record of course we will be stopping at various times to record our episodes, uh, to record our, our, to make a break for advertisements. Nancy, I'm counting on you to be a cl human clock for me. Um, if you can just kind of go like, uh, I'll watch the chat a little bit. And if you can just say, uh, ad would be soon would be good. I'll, I'll keep that in, in mind. That would be great. And then of course I'll have to come up with custom advertisements, um, while we watch the show. <laughs> so. Which is actually really fun to watch. <laughs> I I'm, should write I'm some just notes. Pulling up the list of spacecraft that got blasted by that magnetar one because I realized I didn't have the list in front of me, and that is by far like my favorite story so mm -hmm, far of mm -hmm. 2021. Yeah, yeah, it's like just I mean, this is fresh. This is fresh from this the fresh electrons from the space telescopes. Yes. So we're going to tell you an origin of gamma ray bursts that you have never heard before. And it is awesome. Oh, and remind me to pause. Okay, yeah. yeah pause, Fraser. Okay. Still pulling up the reference. And we keep, like, looking for axions. Like, that's not something I thought we were going to be In doing. Betelgeuse. Yeah, well, they didn't find them there, mm -hmm. but they may have found them associated with neutron stars. Saw that too, yeah. Have I mentioned how much I appreciate the fact that you're covering news these days? Like, Thank you. You're a totally different, a totally different scientist at this point. I wish more people would, would balance that because... It was interesting. I, was, I did an interview earlier this morning with a guy who was working on ice robots. I don't know if you saw this story. No. Um, building robots out of ice. They've been able Gosh. to make the wheels, the structure of the robot, completely out of ice. Um, and so you could go to Titan. Just, with just he said, we figured you know, just with a robot arm, you could, you could build a whole robot. That out of ice. is yeah, excellent. A controller and a robot arm. But, um, but it was interesting because I like because I'm just so in the news all the time and i don't mean like in the news i mean like into the news anyway yeah um uh i just was throwing paper after paper at the guy and he was like oh my god this is so cool i didn't even know about this yeah it was awesome yeah i was doing that during a, a round of grant writing last november where i was talking about uh, stuff that we just covered in astronomy cast and things like that and most scientists don't have time to look beyond the the papers directly relevant to what they're doing and only catch talks that are given by visiting colloquium speakers or that they see at a conference. And with what we do, I don't know about you, but I'm reading anywhere from 10 to 20 different summaries and then at least the abstracts of most of those trying to figure out what's worth reading in detail and it just gives us this repository in our brain yeah 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 there's i mean i think there's this idea of like the google the, the google age right? why should you have to learn anything when you can just use google to act to access and look up anything that you want but i and obviously there's certain things that they're that it doesn't matter but i 
place a tremendous amount of value in jamming as much trivia into my brain as humanly possible. Um, people are still noting to me the fact that the surface of the sun is cooler than the center of the earth. And they, they hadn't even heard that before. I got And like I said, I got a million of these. Um, did you know that the sun is, uh, is giving off 1.5 million tons of material with solar wind every second, but it's forming, or it's turning 4 million tons of hydrogen into helium at the center of itself. So in fact, it's losing more mass because of the fusion at its core than from its solar winds. That. Now, it's not losing the mass. It's converting the mass into energy. And the energy <laughs> is, I have a dog that just sneezed sure. Right violently. Sure. True. Um, yeah. I need you to stop. Yeah, people are noting that you're panting. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I come on up, come up on camera. So, Malachi has chosen this moment to be loving and sweet, not knowing that this is probably going to cause me to banish him, because mm -hmm. he's panting and you can hear him. Um. I think you always have a dog looking for attention. I think they have some kind of schedule they keep. I think they take shifts. So so the issue is this time of day that we're recording Astronomy Cast is after I'm done with Daily Space because can't record two shows at once. Right. And every other day of the week, except for Fridays, this is the time they get to get my attention. <laughs> and so they're like, mom, mom, mom. And I know. Who is a good dog? I mean, who? who? I'm going to have to banish you. Will we ever find out who the good dog is? The good dog is Malachi, it oh, okay. turns out. Okay. All right. Good. So then the I, other ones, when you're, when you're saying who's a good dog, they should be saying Malachi? So, so who's a good dog is always Malachi. Right. Who has a ball is Stella. And who is so not intelligent is Eddie. Oh, poor Eddie. He is really, you not look at him and you can see the lack of neurons firing. This is a dog that I found drinking drainage water off of a cornfield. Lord only knows what chemicals the dog ingested. Right. He's not bright. Oh, poor pup. Hey, um, one last little piece of interesting news. Uh, guess whose daughter is taking astronomy at university? Is it your daughter? My daughter, yeah, Chloe. She's taking astronomy, I don't know, 100, 101. Is she's... she finding it very, very simple? Um, I don't know. She's taking really cool notes, though. And she, you know, she's one of those, like, fancy note takers. Well, she's an artist. Let's be fair. Well, she's, I mean, she's more of a writer, but, but, um, uh, but yeah, no, anyway, so it's, so it's funny. So she's super stoked. And so, she, but hopefully I'm going to be able to like show up and do some question, you know, like do some live telescope work with the class and things like that. So that yeah. would be awesome. Yeah. Super cool. Okay. We should do our jobs. Banish I, I that have... dog. So there, there's two of them. They just start playing directly under the camera. Yes, they're you going away. can't have away. this. Come on. Come on. Yeah, I know. You have thoughts. Come on. People are congratulating. Honestly, I'm a, I'm a little ambivalent, you know? I know how hard it is for people to get careers in the astronomy field. She's going to be a lawyer. Like, just mark my words. My kid's going to be a lawyer. Um, not, not an astronomer, but she had to fulfill her science requirement. And so that was the one that she took. And she was quite excited. She was like, Dad, guess what I'm taking? And so she's been, um, we've been talking astronomy, which is fun. And she's been like rattling off some interesting facts about, about um, stuff she's learning, which is, which is funny. So focus. Am I out of focus? Just let your camera sort it out. There. Done. Okay. Space lawyer. Yeah. Just mentioning, you know, she's taking astronomy, but that's just to fulfill her science requirement. What she's really doing is like mostly criminology. And I think she'll end up being a lawyer. That's, that's cool. Mm -hmm. That will, that will explain 
my interactions with her throughout her entire life. <laughs> Tell her to watch the TV series Alienist if she gets a chance. Yeah, we watched it's... the Alienist. Yeah, we looked at it. Yeah, I can see her adoring that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, let me know when it is that you are prepared to record. I, oh, I am pressing on. record. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. Wait. I moved a window and every window Fine. shut down. Fine. I don't like that. Why? Okay. And um, while he's setting that up, okay, remember, go. folks, we are going out on Houston Channel 21, now media, an edited version, not this. Um, so, so feel free free to like if you know people in Houston recommend us do you want me to go to commercial before I go into the introduction or after why don't you like, do, do the introduction and end it with we'll discuss all of this in detail okay. after this break okay sounds good okay can I press record mm-hmm I have pressed record. It I, is recording. I have Hello, also, Rich. I have Hello, Allie. Record. Hello, Richard. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 592, Gamma Ray Bursts, updated. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today, with me as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, Senior Scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the Director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Our country has moved on into a time where science is constantly being discussed. Yeah. And there is a moon rock, a moon rock in the, the Oval pictures. Office That's right so now. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. It's a cool, it looks big. The, well, got... it, moon rocks come in many different sizes, and if you're going to show one off, don't show off the dust grains. Yeah, show off one of the big ones. Yeah, they brought yeah. back something like 200 kilograms of rock from the moon from dust, and even like that dust is of high value. But oh, the yeah. but the but there are a couple of fairly large rocks, and to have a cool moon rock, that's. I mean, you can imagine anyone who comes in and wants to talk about the future of the moon exploration has to stare at that moon rock and go yeah you want to get more of that 2024 let's go yep Pretty... i it's not going to be 2024 2024 it's... there's there's no reason why actually good news i don't know if you were watching the space launch system hot fire test and the and the abort that went a minute into it but it looks like there was no big problem that they had very tight constraints on it it their test setup rattled a little out of its parameters and they shut it down. So there's nothing very dangerous and they're going to be able to restart the test within a couple of weeks, probably. Well, and so they've decided they're going to do another green test? They haven't said. I'm sure they, they have to. But the point just being they're not going to be spending months or even years taking everything apart, figuring out why there was problems. Right. The, the problem was a sensor to study the test, from what I understand, sort of failed and so the 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 issue is minor the fix is easy and the test can be done again in, in a very rapid period of time so hopefully we won't see a gigantic delay on the schedule the gigantic and, and delay of, on the schedule will come from from everything else adding up and and one of the issues that they're dealing with is the hardware that they're testing is the exact same hardware that they're planning to use for artemis one mission one and, and so they're being extremely conservative because they don't have another yeah, yeah, core yeah. stage waiting to go. Yeah. And they can only refill these nine times. They're not reusable. And each time they fill them to run a test, that super cold liquid, it does damage. Yeah. So this is going to this once its tests are complete, it will be moved and launched. Like this is the one that will launch, the first one, and then it's going to lose its beautiful RS twenty five engines into the ocean, which makes me sad. All right, but it may go around the moon. Yeah, I know it's totally cool. Um, all right, so some of the most powerful explosions in the universe are gamma ray bursts capable of blasting a beam of death 
halfway across the galaxy. In just the last few years, astronomers have discovered a tremendous amount about these blasts and what's actually causing them. The answer, of course, is that it's more complicated than we originally thought. And we'll talk about it in a second, but first, here's our break. Okay. All right. This episode of Astronomy Cast is brought to you by test sensors, reliable test sensors. And we're back. All right, Pamela, it's funny. So in setting up this week's episode, I will look back through the schedule. You know, whenever I brainstorm ideas for episodes, and I'm sure you do the same as well, you sort of look back at what interesting stories are broken and go, have we covered this? And gamma ray bursts is all in the news in the last couple of weeks and years. And I'm like, of course we've covered gamma ray bursts, but when? And it turns out a long, like 500 plus episodes ago was the last time we seriously talked about gamma ray bursts. So it's an entirely new field. And so it's time for a refresh. And, and what gets me is while our little podcast has been around for 15 years, we've been only going out on Now Media Houston 21 for a week. Two weeks. So Right. So you're saying Houston we... has never heard of gamma ray bursts then? Exactly. Right. Exactly. We're going to explain them for the very first time. But but I think that that even the language that we use, the context that we give is going to be different than what we would have done. I, I can't even oh I can't bring myself to listen to our old episode. Um but 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 it's just a different world now. So what is a gamma ray burst? <laughs> So, so as the name implies, when there is a burst of extremely high energy light with wavelengths so short that the light is in the gamma ray part of the spectrum, that light hitting our detectors is called a gamma ray burst. We're kind of lazy when we name things sometimes. Gamma ray bursts were first detected back in the 1960s by the Vail emissions that were launched to look for space tests of nuclear weapons by the Soviets. But instead of seeing any against treaty nuclear tests, this spacecraft, this suite of spacecraft actually, were able to catch all these different little gamma ray bursts and using the timing of when each of the different spacecraft detected the gamma rays, they were able to figure out, okay, so this difference in timing means the light started over there, hit this one first, then this one, then this one. And over the years, they figured out they were coming from all over the sky. So up through the 1990s, we didn't know if these were coming from other galaxies. We didn't know is this something related to the old stars in the sphere of material around our galaxy? And then in the 1990s, we finally were able to start zeroing in on the sources of at least some gamma ray bursts. And I think this is where we're like in the beginning, there was just Oh, yeah, there are these explosions of gamma radiation coming from some random spot in the sky. It we were able to avoid World War Three, which was convenient. Um, the astronomy should never begin a world war. But but then as astronomers started to examine these things, they started to realize that they're not all created equally. Can you hear my dog crying mm -hmm. in the background? No. Okay. It sounds like there's a very sad Chewbacca in the background. Okay, we're just going to continue. Mm -hmm. We're just going to continue. We're professionals. Yes. Have to make sure it's not picked All up on All gamma mic, ray though. bursts not created equally. We discovered. Yes. So so the, the first thing that we zeroed in on was gamma ray bursts seem to come in two different lengths. There were the long ones that were more than two seconds, and there were the short ones that were less than two seconds. And by more and less, I mean the longer ones could last for days in, in the longest cases, and the shortest ones could last for 
fractions of a second, 140 mm. milliseconds. Um, so looking at this distribution where there's a stack of them that are short, a broader stack of them that were long, we started to get hints that there's different physics behind them. And the first time we caught what we now call the optical afterglow of one of these gamma ray bursts, we'd been able to steer a spacecraft that caught the gamma rays to then look at that area in x-rays and see, is there this other component of light that's easier to focus on that maybe will tell us where to focus an optical telescope? The problem that we have is a gamma ray telescope is basically the sky had a burst somewhere. Right. It's, it's kind of like watching meteor showers with people. And you're like, oh, there's a good one. And then they go, where? And you're like, it's, well, it's gone. You yeah. missed it. And then, oh, one over there. Oh, you missed it. And so people, even if you're hanging out with a bunch of your friends and you're all trying to scan, like, did you see that one? Yeah, I saw yeah. it. But someone else didn't see it. And because it's too quick because they're happening so fast. But, but finally, they were able to zero in on it in the x-rays. And then many hours later, catch the last faint bits of optical light associated with what they decided to call a hypernova, some sort of a nova in a very distant galaxy. And from that first discovery in the 90s, we have begun to over and over and over see these optical afterglows from long gamma ray bursts. And for a couple of decades, we consistently explained, well, these are hypernova, they are caused by some sort of a gigantic star in its final days. And for reasons that we don't know, maybe it's orientation. It has a, a massive magnetic field and it is directing gamma rays at us that we are seeing. And the confusing thing was we see supernovae all the time and most of them don't have gamma ray bursts associated with them so the question starts to be what weirdo special physics allows these amazing pulses of high energy light to come traveling our direction well we'll talk about weirdo special physics in a second but first we've got a commercial break And we're back. So what, I mean, I guess people are familiar with the term supernova. And, and I think people are probably familiar with that term hypernova. And so a hypernova is a gamma ray burst. Like you can just now throw away the idea of a hypernova and just replace it with a gamma ray burst. And now exactly. as you, you're going to learn today, a gamma ray burst is a bunch of different things. But <laughs> um, what is this sort of like when you see a gamma ray burst, what is the weird thing, the weird physics that you are observing when you observe a gamma ray burst? Well, what we now know is that for long and only for long only gamma long ray bursts, bursts. Yeah. you have two previously massive stars that are in orbit around each other. One of these started out a bit bigger. It has gone through life. It has gone supernova. It has crunched down into a neutron star and it's hanging out next to its slightly smaller, but not that much smaller companion. And when that still massive, but not as massive companion goes supernova in its own right, trying to form its own neutron star, it explosively sheds its outer atmosphere. And this outer atmosphere goes and it hits that OG neutron star. And it gets consumed in the process. And neutron stars have massive magnetic fields. And this is going to come up later again today. And the interactions of this original neutron star in the system, its magnetic field, everything else that's going on can drive it to spin faster, can drive it to, in some cases, go supernova again, but in this own special way where it's not really a supernova but it's getting so much mass piled onto it that it collapses down into a black hole. And all the physics of that older original neutron star, that's the source of the gamma ray bursts. Wow. 
it's it's the other star that's the source of the light of the supernova that we see in the optical afterglow. And and so I, and so like we know that when a regular when a massive star a star with many times the mass of our own sun goes off as a supernova, it it's remnant that leaves behind like if it's not super big, then it's left with this neutron star. And it starts out spinning very rapidly. And we call that a pulsar and then it slows down and slows down and eventually is less pulsar. -y. Um, but it's this binary interaction with these with two massive stars, one goes off, you get a neutron star, a pulsar, and then the other one goes off shortly afterwards, bombards it with material, and then like spins it up, cranks its magnetic field and makes a, a like a magnetic monster. And you get I and so you say the supernova is coming from the star that goes off. But the gamma rays are coming from the magnetar. They they well, we, we don't even know if it started as a magnetar. It was just a neutron star. Right, right. But but the insanity of this is material can't just go straight from that first star to the second star. It has this annoying property called angular momentum. So the material that's coming ends up spiraling around that neutron star, forming a little tiny accretion disk as that material drives down towards the neutron star. And that spinning neutron disk, that is a source of jets and gamma rays. And, and, if too much of that material makes it onto that companion neutron star, it's going to collapse down into a black hole. Right. It's, it's a two system dynamic and it's the transfer of that material into this new accretion disk, creating these new jets. This is that gamma ray burst that we've been seeing. Interesting. And, and, and which one does this explain the short or the long? This explains the long and only the long. Right. And if you want to read more about these, first of all, don't trust astronomers to name things. Right. But the best studied so far is GRB 190114. This means it was a gamma ray burst that went off on January 14th, 2019. So we know that there are magnetars. No, and I think I mentioned this earlier, maybe not on this show, but there's only like a handful. There's only like 30 magnetars ever found. And these, and so clearly something very special is going on. So do we think that the magnetars were formed as a result of the gamma ray burst or were they already there? And the, and, and that's what causes the burst because you've got a magnetar there. They're somehow involved. It's, it's unclear right now. Okay. And magnetars are one of these weird things that we finally have sufficient technology in our telescopes to be able to study them in ways never before. So a magnetar to, to back up is a special kind of neutron star. It can be a pulsar. It doesn't have to be a pulsar. What it has to have is a massive magnetic field. And when those magnetic field lines break and rearrange, just like we see happening with solar flares in our sun, instead of creating a burst of particles capable of creating well, the aurora we see here on Earth, magnetars, when their field lines break and recombine, can give off massive amounts of gamma rays. How exactly you spin something up and create this magnetic field, yeah. we don't know if there's only one way, but it appears that this kind of a gamma ray burst might be one of the ways you do it. Huh. That, that, that the... The supernova, the nearby supernova forms a monster. It's, it's yeah. how you get, it's like it's, it's supervillain origin story. Is it, was and it, what's kind of amazing is that supervillain that has just been born creates gamma rays that maybe will create Spider-Man later. <laughs> but beyond that, I believe may it's the, create a believe source it's the Fantastic of Four. short period gamma ray bursts. Right. Um, all right, so so then we will talk about the other kinds of gamma ray bursts and how they may or may not be connected. But first, it's time for another break. And we're back. All right, so we've talked about, and you were very clear about this, long gamma ray bursts. But as we mentioned, those are not the only kinds of gamma ray bursts. The trickier ones to see 
are those ones that are like those meteors that disappear within moments, um, the short period gamma ray bursts. So talk about those and then how what we think is causing them. So, so there appears to be two kinds of short period uh, gamma ray bursts. Uh, the, the easy to understand one, if easy is a word that can even be used in this conversation, is the kind that occurs when two neutron stars, so maybe the future of one of these systems we just discussed, when these two no neutron stars are orbiting next to each other, over time they can get closer and closer and closer until they merge into a single object give off a pulse of gamma ray bursts, particles, gravitational waves, and we can detect all of that here on Earth. This was seen back in 2017 for the first time. Yeah, the Kilanova. It's amazing. And this is one of the major contributors to gold. If you're wearing jewelry, it may have come from a short gamma ray burst that had a smooth pulse of light associated with the merger of two neutron stars that may or may not have been magnetars. Right. Uh, so, and that's a completely, well, I, I was going to say that, that it's a different situation, but it's, I mean, you've got a neutron star and a supernova going off, potentially turning into a neutron star in one situation, causing long. a gamma ray burst, the long gamma ray burst, or you've got two neutron stars colliding with each other, causing the short gamma ray burst. Um, so it's- And we still have a third scenario. Right, we'll talk about that in a second, but I guess what I'm saying is that you could you could have a, a, a binary star system could give you one kind of gamma ray burst and then give you the other kind of gamma ray burst some period of time later. And, and in between, it might even have that third kind of gamma ray burst. Okay, what is the third ty type of gamma so, ray burst? So there are magnetars out there that when their magnetic field lines rearrange, give off magnificent bursts of gamma rays that are flickery, flary, and they come in a whole variety of powers, for lack of a better word. Back on December 27th, 2004, one went off in our own galaxy on the other side of the center of the galaxy. And it was so bright that the light went through the sides of space telescopes and saturated right. the detectors. <laughs> that, like, just like wrap your head around that idea. Like that, like imagine you take your telescope, you point it at, I don't know, Jupiter, and the sun gives off a flare that's so powerful, it vaporizes the side of your telescope and makes it very bright. That's what happened. And, and the fact that it was so bright. The telescopes were it, fine, but they were, you know, they yeah, detected but it. It was hard to study because everything was fairly saturated. And while it looked kind of like a short period gamma ray burst, it wasn't bright enough to be classified as a gamma ray burst. And so people started asking the question, can short period gamma ray bursts that don't have that smooth profile, can the flickery flary ones, can those maybe be related to magnetars? And we finally got the answer. And, and here, I'm just gonna take a moment to quote a press release of work done by the researcher Kevin Hurley on a gamma ray burst that was detected on April 15th, 2020. This is how it was detected. And this is, I think, one of my favorite stories in astronomy. Shortly before 4.42 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on that Wednesday, a brief powerful burst of X-rays and gamma rays swept past Mars, triggering the Russian high-energy neutron detector aboard NASA's Mars Odyssey spacecraft, Mars Odyssey, <laughs> right, which has been orbiting the planet since 2001. About 6.6 .6 minutes later, the burst triggered the Russian Konos instrument aboard NASA's wind satellite, which orbits a point between Earth and the sun, located about 930,000 miles, 1.5 million kilometers away. After another 4.5 seconds, the radiation passed Earth, triggering instruments on NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope and the European Space Agency's integral satellite. The burst lasted only 140 milliseconds. Wow. 
And that was one of these magnetar blasts. And, and what was amazing is because the burst was so short and detected by so many different things, they were able to zero in on where it had to be in the sky to have these precise timings as each different instrument was struck with the gamma rays. And when they turned to look with telescopes, they were able to find that it was in a plain Jane galaxy, NGC 253, in the direct direction of the sculptor constellation. It was a magnetar. It had the same flickering pattern that was seen back in 2004, but the light wasn't saturated. And so that distant object gave off light in the exact same way. Mm, but they could observe it. They could observe it. Right. And it was so much brighter that right. it indicated we got lucky in 2004 and magnetars are totally capable of giving off massive short period gamma ray bursts. So to go back to our example, gamma ray bursts in 1911, uh, sorry, 1901-14C, where we had a star exploding, speeding up the neutron star next to it, triggering the gamma ray burst, collapsing down and forming a neutron star. That produced a long gamma ray burst. Over time, if that companion star became a magnetar, as may be possible, it could flicker and flare and give off one kind of short gamma ray burst. And in the fullness of time, when these two finally merge together, that will give off the other short period kind of gamma ray burst. Wow. So everything comes back to magnetars. Everything. That's amazing. Um, and I'm, like, like, I think it's important to understand just how powerful these gamma ray bursts, like how much energy is actually being given off. You know, I mentioned that it fires out a death beam half across the Milky Way. How, how close can you be to a gamma ray burst and it's starting to cause you a problem? If you had one within a few thousand light years of Earth pointed at us, it could ionize the side of our atmosphere it struck, which would be bad for everyone on the planet. Mm -hmm. So so a gamma ray burst going off within, a, say, a few thousand light years, which is a tr enormous distance in space, is like pointed an, at us is an extinction level event for a good portion of life on Earth. And yeah. even one that is like halfway across the Milky Way will will wreck our ozone layer and cause significant damage. It's it's a mind bending quantity of 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 energy. And and there are some hints that we might have had one of these extinction level events in the past, but that's for a different show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Your favorite topic, extinction level events. Thanks, Pamela. That was amazing. Uh, I love the update. It's, it's, you know, for, I've mentioned this for so many of the mysteries that, that we look at dark matter, dark energy, you know, I'm still having arguments with people about, you know, whether dark matter is even a thing. Um, and I believe yes, they believe no, but, but the point being, we may know that it's a thing, but we don't know what thing it is, what's causing it. And yet here's something like, like, gamma ray bursts that we've watched from over the course of 50 years to go from here's something interesting to, oh, it's a lot more complicated than we thought. And here's the explanation. That's beautiful. That's science. I love it. And it's awesome. Yeah, totally. All right. Thank you, Pamela. Do you have some names for us this week? I, I do. So as always, we are supported entirely through donations and, um, if you want to become one of the people that allows us to do this show and pay our editors a fair wage and to make sure that we have transcripts and show notes and all this added material, well, go to patreon.com slash astronomycast and join our community. Um, this week, I would like to thank Martin Dawson, Kenneth Ryan, Stephen Coffey, Semensky, Glenn McDavid, Benjamin Davies, Brento, Nalia, The Air Major, Shannon Humber, Ryan James, Kinesia Pianflienko, 
uh, Sean Freeman, Niall Bruce, Gabriel Galfin, Neuter Dude, Jordan Turner, Ravening, Alan M. Price, Mark Von Coy, Daniel Loosely, and Kimberly Reck. Thank you all so much for, well, allowing us to do what we do. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pamela. And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Okay. And yeah, now we save. 592. I'm now totally paranoid about making sure I save things in the correct folder after sending way too many episodes to the Daily Space folder. Uh, I turned off the notifications on my calendar and it's still, hmm. I'm trying a new system. Actually, I, uh -huh. I've been doing this for a while, but I, I really like it. It's this idea of time block, time block planning. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I now have my day planned into like 15 minute increments for the whole day and i uh, try and do the same thing yeah yeah, yeah. cuz otherwise it's just you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off and and i had a bunch of standard things that i do every day at standard times and mm -hmm. and so i'm but i sort of fall in and out of it so i'm like you know normally i follow a routine but anyway so the point being i've i've got all these blocks in my calendar and my calendar has been like going bleep bloop uh, to tell me to do something. Yeah, Gordon saying there weren't any alerts during the episode. There wouldn't even be alerts because I wouldn't be recording it on the, it wouldn't be heard by my microphone for the episode. But for those of you watching, you hear whatever my computer says. So, so I have to say one of the major reasons I do time blocking is if I don't do time blocking, I end up um, spending too long on things and letting perfection become mm -hmm. the enemy of good. Yep. I, well, and by time blocking, I get back time so that I can actually like live occasionally instead of just right. work. Yeah. Well, so. that's time boxing. That's what I meant to say. Okay. So, so time blocking is, is where you schedule it your whole week hour by hour for the entire week in advance time yeah. boxing is where you limit the amount of time you can work on a project and then you stop working it when the time runs out so i'm doing both of those me things. too yeah yeah okay yeah so generally i will time box and i'll say okay i'm going to take an hour to work on this episode and then at the end i'll reassess if it's done elad avron is saying fraser is the most non-adht person i've ever met i vigorously disagree i am incredibly adhd um, he has the best coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a very complicated apparatus to, con to cope with my very inability to concentrate and focus. Um, well, it's been amazing to watch you evolve this over, like I said, 15 years of mm -hmm, working mm -hmm, together. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember at one point where you, you essentially did the does this give me joy shedding of things in your house way before it was actually a thing right yeah and yeah. and you're just like i'm getting rid of everything yep yeah and and just limiting distractions and it's it, it's funny I, I was talking to my son about this we were talking about like because he's very much like me my daughter is very much like her mother and and my son is logan is very similar to me which is like i could live in an absolute pigsty like I could have, I could have just the world be completely crumbling around me and I would have no problem. I wouldn't feel anxious. It wouldn't bother me. No problem. Um, and except when it actually crumbles. Yeah. Well, like, during like when it causes actual like maintenance issues, but, yeah. but, and so, and so I don't feel anxiety by chaos at all. I, I thrive in it. But at the same time, I do appreciate the value of organization. And so I think I'm able to sort of perfectly tame my disorganized nature with just enough organization to allow me to be productive with the chaos. So so I think, Ilad, I 100% I disagree with you. I'm probably one of the most... Um, chaos? chaos? You are, you are an, a chaos engine. I am, an, I, I am absolutely an engine of chaos. I love chaos. 
Like I, I enjoy, like if you said, let's just watch TV shows at random, I would be down with that. Right? Like, like we're just going to start watching stuff at random. 100%. Let's do it. Uh, we're going to pick where we're going to go on planet Earth just by spinning the globe. Yeah. We're going to eat food that we've never had before. I would like every meal to be something totally different. That would be great. But, but I understand that that does not make for regularly producing tele, you know, shows. So, so I have to hold my chaos in a structure of you of you systems. have structured chaos because mm -hmm. when when we first started the show the idea that we had a topic and that was all we had mm -hmm. was utterly terrifying for me <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true yeah yeah i love it Cause, yeah because i i came from slacker astronomy which was entirely scripted yeah, yeah. No, I didn't and, have time and for that. The, the daily space is scripted we need to figure out how to make it less scripty um but but with astronomy cast, you write your intro. I don't see the intro nope. before yeah, you or after you write it. Yeah. So just to be clear, Pamela does not. I'm sometimes writing the intro as she's showing up in the Zoom meeting. Yeah. So all we know is the topic. Yeah. Yeah, and she and, has no access to it unless it's kind of tricky. And we'll briefly. I'll go. I was thinking of talking about this and then that, and she'll go like, Yeah, that sounds good. So it's not like a complete surprise. And we have more than once had during the live recording and then edited out for the podcast or the show, a Fraser asks me a question and I'm like, I, what planet are you on? <laughs> and there was one particular episode on bolids where you went somewhere where I was like, I have never heard any of the words that just came out of your mouth. And this was when we were recording over Skype, so no one else saw this. Right, right, right. And we stopped our recordings, and you explained everything to me. <laughs> we yeah. started back up, and I just answered you as though I had known all the things that you just taught me. That is awesome. Um, yeah, it's funny. It's uh, it's. I wonder for people who are like have been listening to this show for a long time, whether. Because I've gotten better at astronomy and you've gotten better at news. Yeah. And I wonder if that makes the show worse. If you know what I mean. Like, does it make it that there's less genuine You're asking discovery? more intelligent questions. Like, you used to periodically ask questions where I was just like, no, no, please don't ask me that. No. <laughs> right, right, you right. don't ask those anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's, uh, but I wonder, I mean, maybe the audience, like, do they find that now that we are more similar in knowledge and experience than we were in the past, whether we're having as much discovery I don't know. as we used to? I don't know. Interesting. Because cause I feel like in the past, it was very much like I was just a bull in a china shop, just smashing Well, and around. you no longer are... are asking me to stop and explain things as much as you used to. And I don't know if that's yeah. me getting better about what words I use yeah. or you know more of the words I use. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And use them all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Like one of the things, like I'm a terrible editor. I'm awful. I'm the worst editor, which is weird because I'm the publisher of Universe Today. But there's like, a difference between publisher and editor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The trick to being being the publisher, my trick to editing is to not. Um, but, and the reason part of why I'm such a bad editor is because I just, I get it. Like I, I, like I get what you're trying to get across. And, and, and so knowledge transferred. Like if I really sat down and thought of a better way, maybe I could, sure, why not? But that's, you know, who's got time for that? Like you did it. So, so I wonder though, like if, if, if I could still be the every person, if I know too much and I wonder, anyway, please let us know if, if, if it's made the show better or worse, the fact that you know way more about news, your knowledge is, I think you are more useful than me now because you are, you have a much more up-to-date wide-ranging knowledge and you can kind of synthesize all the stuff in real time. Like this episode today was wonderful for that exact reason that you knew the latest research on a very complicated topic and it was wonderful to listen to see but you know how to ask questions like 
I have watched you do interviews mm-hmm. and you you're really good at interviewing people. I've watched me do interviews <laughs> and it's like I survived. Yeah. Well, it, I now have Beth do the interviews on Daily Space because she is a much better interviewer than I am. Beth Johnson, who's also on Weekly Space, hang out with you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah. Because I'm equally enthusiastic about everything and don't know where to put my enthusiasm. Right. The the thing that I found is is interesting. Like I've I've been a lot more interested in doing interviews. I really enjoy them. And I enjoy them because uh, we can get the fresh information from the experts who are doing the work and and not trying to synthesize it and make a bunch of mistakes. And and so I think it's really valuable. So interviewing is just, I mean, it's just another skill, right? Like anything. Um, and you are good at it, just... Well, I think it, it, it. So we did this interview earlier today with this guy who was doing uh, these ice robots, and I was just like, "What? What about this paper? What about these technologies? What about this expert who's working? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera." And he was like, "Like literally, just like writing stuff down. Like, I haven't heard of this. This is amazing. This is perfect. Yeah." So, so I think it's important. The more of this stuff, the more people you talk to, the more you are able to connect all of these little pieces together and bring them to bear on this on this question. I, I'm also seeing an important difference here. You are a natural extrovert. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I play an extrovert on the internet. And so <laughs> the fact that you like talking to people mm-hmm. probably has a large degree to do with this. Yeah. Although it's funny, as I get older, I'm less extroverted over time. I've become more introverted. Um, like a, I'm definitely like I remember as like a teenager, like 19, 20, all I could think about was calling all my friends as you wanted to hang out. And now I can go weeks without talking to another human being and and I'm OK. So we were designed for the pandemic. Yeah, maybe. Or I, <laughs> I had adapted just in time to the pandemic. Um, but yeah, it's like now, uh, you know, because we can't see people like I still go for walks with my friends and stuff. But it's but it's very much about. I'm, I'm hanging out with Carla. I'm hanging out with my son. I'm talking to Chloe. I'm talking to my friends on Skype. And then, I, of course, all the stuff that we do all week um, is, you know, I mean, I'm talking to human beings around the world all the time. So yeah. this is almost interaction, but it doesn't compare to like going to a conference and hanging out in real time and, and drinking a beer and, and hanging yeah. up, catching up with your friends. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Sorry, we didn't have any questions. We questions. just babbled we today. Just, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. I'm not going to apologize. Uh, but it, was, it just started from Elad Avron making a, you know, unsubstantiated, uh, aggressive comment about me being an organized and disciplined person. Take You take that back, sir. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, uh, thank you, Pamela, for joining me today for this episode of Astronomy Cast. Thank you to all of our uh, everyone watching, both on YouTube and on Twitch. Thanks to all the moderators. Thanks, of course, Nancy Graziano for keeping us organized. I cannot wait to be able to hang out with as many of these people in person. So watch the COVID vaccine tracker. Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.